Welcome back, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce the next lecture, Megan Smith. Megan is an English graduate of St. Catherine's College, Oxford, and a lifelong lover of dance. She currently works to promote performing and written arts at the National Literacy Trust. And we welcome her on a, to give us a talk about Shakespeare ballets and gesture. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you, Sue, and hello, everybody. And as Sue mentioned, I did do my undergraduate just down the road at uh, St. Catherine's College. And both during and following my time as a student here, I've been very interested in the, the knotty relationships between dance and text. And so today I'm going to be looking at a topic I seem to always want to come back to, and it's one of the most familiar and long-standing textual corporeal relationships in the Western ballet landscape, which is balletic adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. Now, existing critical discussions concerning this relationship fall largely into one of two broad camps, and these can be called the significance of dance to Shakespeare and the converse, the significance of Shakespeare to dance. The former has a more extensive critical history, dominated by Alan Brissenden's seminal work, Shakespeare and the Dance, in which he looks at 16th century court and social dancing and understands them in a very socio-political way. And certainly those porous formal boundaries between drama, dance and music in early modern performance environments call on students of Shakespeare to at least consider the ways in which individual and social choreographies contributed to those contemporary understandings of Shakespeare's work. However, although Shakespeare's use of dance is important and fascinating work, I do think we need to recognise that that dynamic of Shakespeare using dance is not the primary way a 21st century audience experiences the relationship between dance and the plays. Western dance culture has changed in innumerable ways between the early modern period and now, and not least with the professionalisation of ballet. So I think rather than, as so often happens, rather than centralising Shakespeare as the, the ultimate creative artist from whom everything else must, must follow. I think it makes sense to turn to that second camp I mentioned earlier and delve into what happens when Shakespeare's plays are made to work in service of ballet and what we can learn about both art forms. So that's where this quote from, from Sarah Crompton's 2015 Guardian review of Kenneth Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet comes in. It might seem a strange way to perform Shakespeare without words. And I want to start by saying that I think, actually, strange is the right word. I don't think it just seems strange, I think it is. But not in the sense that Crompton's alluding to here. She's alluding to... The, the slightly snobbish academic perception, or particularly within Shakespeare's studies, that, that performing his plays in a non-verbal way is odd or even a limiting choice. I think that actually it's, it's strange in the sense of defamiliarisation, in not in lack of subtlety or lack of richness or lack of sophistication. But strange in the sense that we're taking something we know very well, stories we're extremely familiar with, and we're decentering our preconceptions about them, and we're recasting the narrative in new relief. We're exploring something we know and making ourselves constantly reevaluate and reconsider those supposed certainties. Okay, 
And so that's where we really come to the, this second part, which is negotiating character interiority and gestural expression. And those are really the two, the two tenets of balletic narrativity that I want to focus on today. Character, subjectivity, and then gesture as a form of signification, as a way of making meaning and telling stories. Okay, so let's think about those two things a bit further and how they actually work on a mechanical level in narrative ballets. And to do that, I want us to start with romanticism or romanticisms, because that's an important movement for ballet and Shakespeare and Shakespearean ballet. So romanticism is important to ballet because it's the time when we really start to see character come to the fore. It's when the female ballerina becomes the aesthetic, technical and also therefore narratorial centrepiece of the performance. And there's many, many critics who have looked at that in much greater depth. But I just want to note, focus on that main point, that character becomes important. But romanticism is important in a literary context as well as a balletic one. Because ballet does something very unusual, historically speaking, with the way it reads Shakespeare. And that takes us to these two particular quotes. And it's that ballet reads Shakespeare a bit like a romantic critic. So we've got our 16th century plays being read in the 20th, 20th and 21st centuries like an early 19th century person. Completely wacky, but extremely cool. And the way that ballet reads Shakespeare like a romantic critic falls into these two counts of character and gesture. So as Coleridge famously argues about Shakespeare, the interest in the plot is always, in fact, on account of the characters, not vice versa. And we know that the, really the core components of narrative ballet is character. You need principal, artist, soloist, core. Our building blocks are, are characterological. And the second important thinker here is Edmund Burke and his very long-winded text or treatise called A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. And what's important in this treatise for today's work is that emotions and meaning-making is felt to be deeply embedded in the body. And that's, and we have, that we must have a shared language to express emotion. But not just in a, in a facial way or in very simplistic gesture, but in quite a complex, multifaceted way. So, for example, here, the physical cause of love is the head reclining to one side, eyelids closed, mouth a little open, whole body composed, and hands full either to the sides. You can really picture a romantic under his tree like that in love. So, as we can see, ballet as a corporeal medium of expression is predicated exactly on the viability of those ideas. That movement and the body makes meaning all the time and we share that as a narrative. So that's our second pillar, our gesture. Okay, so now we've got our, our two pillars. They're actually really competing imperatives for choreographer writing a narrative ballet. So we've got character, which is about interiority, subjectivity, the psyche. It's complex and, and subtle. And then we've got gesture as our, our mode of making meaning, which relies on, on shared understandings, on large movements, and on the, the idea that you can literalise the internal, or you can literalise an idea. They're slightly at odds with one another, so it's very interesting to see how ballet copes with that, because, of course, we know Shakespeare uses the soliloquy. Well, how can ballet make a soliloquy out of, out of gesture? So, let's look at our first example, which is really one of the, the simplest modes of gestural signification and it kind of follows the 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 concepts 
of these kind of gestures that we all learnt from when you first start doing ballet, that essentially a static action or a near static, static action has an exact meaning. Okay, so I'm going to start with Christopher Wielden's The Winter's Tale, which was first performed by the Royal Ballet in 2014. And we're going to be looking at Hermione's trial scene in, in Act 1, which is where she's trying to convince Leontes that she is innocent of the infidelity charges that he's brought to her. So in the Shakespearean text, she twice turns to this word beseech. And it's that particular word that I would like us to focus on when we look at how this is performed. Now, I really hope this, this is going to work. If not, everybody's going to unfortunately have to see me do a rendition, which I don't think anybody wants. <laughs> oh, we could all be in for a treat. Okay, that's fine. Essentially, the movement, <laughs> the movement that she does, luckily it's very simple, is, is this. She repeats this gesture. This is beseech. And there's quite a lot of ways that that that's really an obvious way of portraying the idea of beseech. It, the dynamic replicates the intent of the feeling. It comes from the, the individual to the recipient. We go from the inner to the outer. That makes sense. It also very clearly replicates our kind of shared, non-balletic gestural language of begging and of, of asking for something or praying. So in a, in a non-balletic context, it makes total sense. And that could be all it is. It could be just that we're looking at the transposition of, of word to movement and it's just successful and simple. But I think that idea of just poetry in motion or, or word into movement is, is too simple because when we read Shakespeare as literary critics, we think about all oh, this these influences, these connotations, these references. And I think it's only fair to do the same with dance. Gesture is just as capable of having connotations and influences and references as, as verbal language is. So I think there's space where to triangulate that dynamic of word to movement and to consider a third, a third element that's taking place. For me personally, I think this is just my interpretation, is that this movement calls in a particularly Graham-esque way of moving. It's very much about the, the turning in of, of the demi-bras. It's about suffering. It's, it's very beseeching. And if that is the case, if there is room here to have, to have Shakespeare's language the gesture, the instantaneous gesture, and the reference to other dance cultures, then actually we're looking at a far more complex interpretation than it first seems. There's actually elements of, of performance, as you know, Martha Graham is the ultimate what creative artist of articulating human suffering and of transgression in, in terms of dance as well. And I think that adds a very interesting element to this scene where Hermione's, the female character is being attacked by the male. I think that, that's an interesting dynamic to bring into play. Okay, beseeching's a fairly simple thing to convey through words and it could just be that it's transposition. But The Winter's Tale has at its core an emotion that's much more difficult to literalise physically, which is jealousy in the form of Leontes. Jealousy is predicated on inwardness. It's more at home in a verbal soliloquy than, than in an external gesture. But I think Wielden does a very brilliant job, actually, of capturing jealousy, but not just capturing, I think he's interpreting it, which is crucial. So I'm imagining that the, 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 the clip won't work here, so I'll just explain what's, what's really important. And it's this third quote that's the most important here. It's, there may be in the cup a spider steeped. Now that's an extreme well-known metaphor from this play where Shakespeare's 
discussing jealousy, and it's like this spider inside the cup that Laertes is drinking from. So the idea of that metaphor is that it's external, the jealousy. It's corrupting. It's like a parasite. It's not coming from inside Laertes. And I think that's exactly how Wielden makes it work, is he takes that spider metaphor, and I don't know if anybody's seen this, this ballet and can remember, but there's a lot of movement in Leontes' uh, dance that's to do with this gesture here, this hand doing this. His hand crawls up his own arm and then up his neck and into his mouth. And it's, it is a little transposition of these words, but it's interpretive of, of jealousy and it allows it to become external and corrupting. And I think that's a very, very smart move. But there's more to Leontes' movement and it, the way that the principles of ballet are brought in to help make this signification process work even better. And that it's Leontes' movement is very contrapuntal, it's very uncomfortable, it's very at odds with the principles of rectilinearity, complementary lines. There's none of that. When he's at, its, he's at his most jealous, he is he's contracted in his core, he's walking on fondue, but on Demi Point, which is very parasitic-like. He looks very like, much like an insect, I think. He's kind of, he walks kind of like this. And I think it's breaking those balletic conventions that show us that how he's feeling is wrong, it's negative, it's bad. It would be far less powerful if his jealousy was portrayed as, you know, very nice lines. The fact that it is breaking what we expect to see shows us much more about his character development. And the other potential interest here, and I think this, I do think this is coincidental, but I think it still exemplifies the capacity for other influences to be at work when we're performing Shakespeare physically. And that is that though that exact body posture is how the character of Hyde was performed in the Jekyll and Hyde plays when they were first put on stage. So it's monstrous and it it, the potential for that link, I think, is what makes the physicality of this character so exciting. Okay, so we're, we're looking now at the kind of the disruption of balletic convention. And one of the earlier performances of a Shakespeare play as a ballet is Ashton's The Dream. And one of the moments that I think really stands out and a lot of people remember from this ballet is when Bottom performs as a male dancer on point. And there's a kind of obvious reason for doing this. It looks like hooves. He has his dark grey point shoes and it replicates the idea of, of the donkey really, really well. But I think there's a little bit more complexity to, the, to this moment as well. And it's not always comfortable, I think, in terms of how it deals with gender, but it is complex. So the language in this scene, when we're talking about Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, is full of understatement, euphemism, pun. That's language that's very difficult to translate into gesture because it's extremely non-literal. The actual point of that use of language is it's not literal. So, thou art changed, the bathos of that line, the, well, yeah, yes, he is, in quite an obvious way. But I think it's the fun in that language, it's the, it's the fun that's important when we talk about these point shoes. And then Bottom himself, this line here, I've had a most rare vision, and he makes this pun, man is but an ass if he go about to expand this dream that use of the word ass there, describing himself as a donkey, is meant to be this big joke. Bottom's not even realised that he's making a joke about his donkey head. So I think it's that the slippage of language there that Ashton's trying to, to make work in a balletic context. And that is why, to an extent, he's used these point shoes, because we need something in the ballet language that's 
equally disruptive of convention, that equally shows us slippage and shows us gappiness and um, a difficulty in, in just being literal when we're telling a story. So I think it's the messiness and the kind of the comic incongruity that's important for these point shoes. It's not just that they make him look like an actual donkey. And of course, that as I would just mention that, of course, the it should be really not comic or, or strange to have a male dancer in point shoes, but I do think that is what the joke is here. Okay, and we come to a, what is one of my favourite uses of balletic principles it's it's generic principles to create meaning and it's from kenneth Macmillan's romeo and juliet and this this uh, image is from the 2012 performance um, with the royal ballet and it's from the tomb scene in act three and it's i'm sure anyone who's seen it um, probably a lot of people have is will remember it's an extremely powerful moment this it's an absolute breakdown of the pas de deux, Romeo's trying to replicate the movement performed earlier in the balcony scene, and it keeps failing. Namely, Juliet keeps falling to the floor, literally, that it just won't work. Now, this is interesting because the pas de deux is set up as a real communicative tool in this ballet. The balcony scene and that pas de deux depicts a moment in the play of successful communication. Romeo and Juliet are able to talk to one another. They finally do you know, give, tell each other they love each other. It's extremely uh, moving, etc. Some of the most famous metaphors are from that particular section. It's all about successful communication. The tomb scene here is about miscommunication. Exactly what's happening in the narrative. They are they have misunderstood one another. They aren't able to tell one another that they're not actually dead, you know? Uh, we all know how Romeo and Juliet goes. So I think it's very interesting, then, that the pas de deux has to break down to show that this is the case. The pas de deux becomes a communicative tool to show either successful communication or unsuccessful communication. I think it also does some interpretive work for the play, and I think by linking those two scenes together, we start to see the parallels of love and death, and they are made to resemble one another, even though they are each other's counterpoint. So I think it's fair to say Macmillan's not, not redressing the story, he's not completely altering Romeo and Juliet, but he is exploiting the possibilities offered by movement to make sure that the ballet is not just a rendition of, but a reading of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's plays. So the thing to remember here as well is that, of course, when we perform Shakespeare as a play, it's physical. We can still make physical parallels between a balcony scene and the tomb scene. We could just have actors in a play stand in the same spot on the stage. We could create links that way. But I think the very virtue of ballet as non-verbal means that the physicality must come to the fore. It must be the most central part, and therefore we're able to have additional work going on. We're able to have the narrative we all recognise from the text, and we're able to have additional interpretation. Okay, and so we come to really a working towards a theory of what Shakespeare as ballet is. And I think a useful voice here is, is Linda Hutchin in, in a theory of adaptation, where she says, an adaptation is an acknowledged transposition of a recognisable other work. Therefore, an adaptation is a derivation that is not derivative, a work that is second without being secondary, it's the most crucial part. It is its own palimpsestic thing. And that word palimpsestic, thinking about layers. And we come back to what I said earlier about the triangulation. I think it's the multiplicity of meaning 
by making Shakespeare ballet that's the most exciting thing, that it could be Shakespeare's word, it could be reference to a dance style, it could be the literal donkey, it could be the breakdown of the generic principle and playing with gender in ballet, it could be all of those at the same time. So, so rather than assume that Shakespearean ballet exists solely to represent or, or represent the ballet, should be seen that the ballet form itself necessitates and makes possible exciting and, and radically dynamic alterations of the Shakespeare play. And as I say, some of the most exciting work is the capacity to make space for coexisting and sometimes simultaneous reference to the play and to balletic culture. And so I come back to the, the idea of, of strangeness and the, the de idea of decentralisation. And I think those connections, something that's inspiring to me and interesting to me is that the Shakespeare or text, you know, the, the core story, is not the only thing at play. It's, it's contextualised by other artistic work that's in competition with and sometimes in symbiosis with with the narrative itself. And so I think it makes a really important case for performing Shakespeare where, where the text is decentralised from the narrative and, and also makes the important case for ballet's capacity as a really sophisticated narrative art form that we can put on a level with, with the, this cultural monolith and see exciting things happen. So that's, that's everything um, I wanted to talk about today. As I said, it's a very ongoing, ongoing project and I look forward to seeing uh, future adaptations of Shakespeare's plays and um, even more radical interpretations. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Um, that got us thinking about Shakespeare now. Um, any questions here? A anyone got anyone? Immediately, yes. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying about the disruption of balletic convention because it reminded me a lot of what Ninette de Valois felt about classical ballet in 1926 when she was very much sort of thinking about laying the foundations of British ballet. She talks about how it has, classical ballet has to be extended through sort of integration of modern dance forms mm -hmm. in order to come into harmony with other arts of the theatre and become more expressive. Mm -hmm. So is that what's happening here? Is it that classical ballet has to be disrupted or extended to sort of be able to express these character interiorities? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, interesting point. Is it that there's a question, isn't there? Is are we altering balletic convention because those conventions don't let us tell Shakespeare stories to to sufficient depth? Um, to a degree, I think. The, the richness of Shakespeare's texts probably inspire creativity. But I would also want to, to look at it from the other point of view and consider that we're using balletic conventions. They are being played with, but they're what's at, at, they're what's at the fore, if that makes sense. So it's about the generic principles of the ballet and Shakespeare's just the tool for doing that. So if we, we centralise ballet, that's the most important thing happening. So rather than just ballet accommodating Shakespeare, I think we're, we're sometimes playing with Shakespeare in order to accommodate the ballet form. Um, yes. If they, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Okay. I was wondering... Um, I was wondering if you could say anything about the use of the chorus, 
in, uh, and, and the function of, of choral elements to uh, suggest mood or tone mm. that is some, you know, that is somehow um, useful to dance as an art form if you're narrativizing mm-hmm. a Shakespeare uh, production on stage. I was thinking of the cor- of um, um, Wielden's use of the chorus in uh, in Winter's Tale, and he he kind of adopts sort of rather expressionistic uh, mechanisms there, or or of indeed of the the fairies in um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's what's very interesting about the use of the chorus is that we're almost skipping back further than Shakespeare that and we're going really back to kind of like to, to Greek um, tragedies but I think particularly there's an instance in the Winter's Tale where I think it works really well which is in Act 2 and it's a really significant interpolation with the play or interpretation of the play that joyous element with, with Perdita is expanded massively from the play that's it's a real change to have that as such a prominent part of the narrative and i think it's actually another instance that i didn't have time to talk about today but where it's self it's sort of self reflective and it, it reflects on on ballet as much as it does on shakespeare because that act two where we're really joyous and it's very pastoral and it it feels like giselle that act two, we're suddenly we're we're in the gloomy Shakespeare, and and then act two, we're in Giselle, and I think the way that that influences the the interpretation of the narrative, and that it has space for Shakespearean pastoral to also be nineteenth century balletic pastoral, and to feel more more magical and and more countryside. That's not a that's not a descriptive word, um, but I think that's really interesting, the way the chorus is used there to evoke that mood that's just not in the play. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, any any more questions? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe I was thinking about something else, but yeah. I, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for your your really brilliant paper and for like talking about this like complicated relationship between like gesture and like feeling um, mm-hmm. and like a social choreography as well. I thought that was a really cool connection. Um, so I'm I'm going to think about Nietzsche a little bit, which because mm-hmm. my question was maybe subconsciously Nietzsche, which was if this like um, if the gesture is expressing an emotion. I was wondering what possibility are there in these ballets, especially that really beautiful um, Macmillan scene, the Romeo and Juliet duet, mm. which you pointed us to, for expressing like non verbalizable feelings. I feel like that's always mm. the thing that people say about dance is like, one thing that people say about dance is it can express something that's hard to put into words. Yeah. So I was wondering about that relationship, which I guess is the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Apologies for. You don't have to talk about the Nietzsche bit, but just <laughs> the other bit, sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, fab. Uh, and that's actually very interesting because that Sarah Crompton quote, that's exactly what she goes on to say right after that, is that when she says, I'm paraphrasing, she says something, when dance is this expressive, it's, it's more meaningful and more sophisticated than, than, any, than any poetry or any words. So... There is very much that sense that that dance communicates the incommunicable, if if that makes sense. So the reaching beyond words, and I do think that is a really important element to to our our readings of Shakespearean ballets, is that they can do more than just enact the plays. They aren't just transpositions. And the idea of wordlessness as a mode of communication and that tomb scene as you say as you uh, mentioned that's not it is about communication and miscommunication and that's kind of why the padded breaks down i think but it's not directly performing the language of the play it's 
just adding a whole other element that Shakespeare's not really mm, referencing. And that's the other thing that's important, I think, here, is that Shakespeare himself uses language in a very gappy way. And he, that's the, Emma Smith talks a lot about Shakespeare's gappiness and his ambiguity. So I think this is kind of why choreographers come back to Shakespeare, because A, he's a monolith, but B, because the, the ambiguity in his language makes, it makes a lot of potential for the gesture to take the play further than the text does and, and to show us more than is, is written on the page. Thank you for your wonderful talk. I was wondering in terms of um, uh, reception and cultural encoding, um, what might, um, right, I've, I've said the two big words. I need to put them in the right order now. Um, you're talking about reception of Shakespeare, basically, mm -hmm. right? And how it kind of integrates elements of romanticism and, mm -hmm. and, and all that. I'm wondering to what extent with um, Wielden's choreography, for instance, he uses what you just called the gappiness mm. to put in contemporary references, cultural references, that would have no meaning, no signification, no significance um, in 20 years' time, or in a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what what is the part of that cultural encoding and how, um, how that contemporary cultural encoding that's happening there is interacting with what is being received, in essence, Shakespeare in this case. Sorry, it's a complicated question. So, so I, will I will try and answer that. It's a very, very good question. Um, I think what came to my mind immediately was that if we're thinking about reception of Shakespeare in it and how ballet has, has received it at different historical moments and different cultural moments, is that although, as I said at the beginning, that this, this romanticism is really important both to literary cultures and Shakespeare and also to dance, is that that time where we're starting to see subjectivity become really important in ballet, there's not very many Shakespearean ballets at all. There's, there's Corrales, La Tempête, and I think that, I, as far as I'm aware, that's it until the 1870s. So it's interesting that the 20th century and the 21st century are much happier with interpreting Shakespeare or they're much more drawn to it as, as, a so as source material. In terms of contemporary references and the idea of the, the filling in the, the gappiness of Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare himself would understand that way of performance and that idea of creativity. His plays are just versions of older stories. Most of the time, he's not made up a story at all. They're existing poems, they're existing plays. So I think if Shakespeare were to see lots of references in, say, Wilden's The Winter's Tale that he didn't recognise, I think that would make total sense. There's a lot in the text that's specific to the audience and that interpolates the original or narrative. So I think that is kind of the culture with these narratives, is that they are open to immediate contemporary interpretation, and that's just a cycle that continues. And what I think Shakespeare sets up to allow everybody to do following that is that gappy language. Whether that's intended or not, probably not, is that it makes those interpretations really exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanted to, to go back to your example of the Hermione gesture. Mm. And, um, and just to, to 
you, you see it as a gesture of beseeching. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm sort of trying to work out how much that is, um, you, you're seeing it that way is because you know what the story is. Mm. And that that gesture, I mean, I, I think we saw it yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right that this is my, this is my personal interpretation. And there's a couple of things that are important. Is the, the idea that dance works, as you're saying, just on um, a kind of instantaneity. And it's about the specific moment that it's performed. And really, it's very arbitrary. It comes back, I mean, in, as words are, are arbitrary signs in linguistic terms. So... It's about the, as you said, the context in which it's performed that imbues it with meaning. And to an extent, the context is the part of the narrative. If we know that this is the moment in the play, this is the exact part where Hermione is saying this word, and that she says beseech twice, and we see this twice, makes the link possible for me. But it's just a potential link. And it's very, very possible that Wielden doesn't intend it to be that way and that audiences will interpret it in, on an individual basis. So that's another really important element of, of gesture. And you know, theoretically speaking, language works in the same way. It's just not, gesture's not quite as codified. Um, so that's an exciting part of performing it physically, I think, is the room for interpretation. As I say, it's the potential for the multiplicity of meaning. It could be at once beseech. It could be also reference to another type of movement. It could also be a different feeling altogether. So I think that's what's really fantastic about it, is the simultaneous multiplicity. Any, any uh, advances on that one? And anyone upstairs want to add to anything? <laughs> um, you, you, the kinsfolk of romanticism, I don't, I'm, we know very little, and I'm, I'm, Jessica, you can't help me, but I, as, a, as a great pre-romantic choreographer, Salvatore Corrigiano, or Zanno, was known as the Shakespeare of the dance, and choreographed the Triolena and the Marcello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think that's that's very true. It's that there's other, as you say, in in opera, there's other uses of dance in a Shakespearean context. I suppose I feel that romantic ballet looked to La Tempête and, and then much later in the nineteenth century to uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream because that worked for romantic ballet, those stories, those narratives specifically, because they had that element of the supernatural, the element of the ethereal central female character. And I think opera, probably, well, I'm not an opera expert by any means, but I think in 19th century ballet was a little bit more about the, that ethereal female figure and I think Shake a lot of Shakespeare's plays didn't really work to do that so I think by the 20th and 21st centuries there's more scope in terms of what ballet can be about 
that allows more Shakespearean plays to, to be to be used. So yeah, the Romantic Period is really strange. It's a it's a really a historical and unusual phenomenon. What happens there? The way that it interacts with Shakespeare in such contradictory ways. I think, as as you mentioned. I suddenly had a thought about um, mind reading. Yeah, I, I don't. I cannot remember the name of the um, 20th century philosopher who wrote on Shakespeare's plays, and he wrote an essay on the Scottish play. We're not supposed to say it, are we? <laughs> um, about the extraordinary speed with which you know events mm -hmm. happen, and a lot of it is dependent on the non-linguistic connection between himself, Macbeth, and his wife. Mm -hmm. And, and I think Kurt Limon and um, Pauline Kona did, um, did a version of, of Macbeth mm -hmm. as, a, as a pas de deux, which mm -hmm. is extraordinary. There is a film of it in the New York Public Library, if ever oh. get there again. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he <coughs> it seems that Limon you know, caught hold of this issue of the connectiveness, the connectivity mm -hmm the unconscious, almost, connectivity mm. between those two. Um, I just wondered if there's anything else that, that you think that dance and ballet in particular is, is able to do that, um, you know, that Shakespeare, that we could learn from ballet, you know, yeah. in, in rereading Shakespeare. I think that the Macbeth in particular, I, th I, I would love to see a full-blown adaptation of, of Macbeth. I think ballet does does spirits and ghosts extremely well. Um, thinking about um, Giselle in particular, uh, I would love to see how that played out in Macbeth and how that could be particularly, particularly haunting. In terms of what performance of Shakespeare can learn from, from its balletic interpretations, I think it's a way of there's a quite a culture of repositioning Shakespeare's plays in new contexts, isn't there? There's, you know, much I've seen a much about nothing set in fascist Sicily, that, for example, is that, that repositioning historically. And they tend to work on a very A to B process. It's about, okay, this needs to become this, and this, this, and this, this. And I think what we could learn from from balletic adaptations is that they can have, uh, I keep saying these words, the plurality. So, for example, The Winter's Tale can be Giselle for part of it, but it only needs to be part. And it can be a totally different thing as another part of the play. So I think we can look at the, the plurality of our interpretations and how they can reference many different things. But also, ballets Wielden's is an example, The Winter Tale is an example, Macmillan's Romeo and Juliet is another example of redistributing time in Shakespeare's plays. So those are, they're set from five acts into three. And I think that does something very interesting in, in terms of the narrative. It portions things out in a different way. It allows the balcony scene and the tomb scene in, in Romeo and Juliet to become greater parallels because there's a more clear coding of sections. I think that's something that uh, that dramatic performances don't tend to play with quite so much is is time and structure of Shakespeare's plays. It seems almost like a sacrilegious thing to do to mess with the plot, but I think that could be that could be something I'd like to see more of. Thank you so much, Megan. That, uh, that's great. Are there any more questions? No. I think this is uh, a good moment then. Oh yes, Mama. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you use the word like decentralize the text at some point. Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how ballet should like what attitude it should take to a text, mm -hmm. because I was thinking about it's not Shakespeare, but it's um, Wolf. Yes. They did Wolf works, and I think the final ballet they must have. They put either the text on stage or they had a voiceover. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that one maybe wasn't successful because it acknowledged or it seemed to take 
the attitude that the dark was a supplement, that there was an mm. original, mm -hmm. that it couldn't compete with text, so they just had to put it up. Mm. Um, and you were talking about mime and how, technically speaking, you can transcribe each noun in each verb. Like mm. I was watching a BBC production where they had the sign language interpreter. Yeah. So there's a step towards that, but do you think it's more successful if you just ignore the presence of a text, just like interpret it with its own grammar of that? Mm. Yes, I think that that's a very interesting question. And there's a part of me from a kind of um, just own personal opinion point of view is that I love when the ballets assert themselves as they're just as sophisticated as their or text, so the, the original text. And as you say, bringing the actual words on stage, it can feel a little like we're interpreting the original. We're just, we're just performing the, the actual narrative as it pre-exists. So there's nothing inherently wrong with including the text, and there's a really interesting there's really interesting potential to play with the relationship in a creative way. I think modern dance and contemporary dance does that probably more than, than ballet. But in terms of the relationship between the two, the two grammars and the two vocabularies, I once uh, saw, I, I don't even know if it was a professional performance, I think it might have been a youth performance at the Lowry Theatre in Manchester of some performing the sonnets. And they looked at the rhythm of the poetry and, the, that, and used that as part of the grammar. And so the movement had to follow the iambic pentameter and it had to be portioned into certain chunks in order to replicate the, the length and form of the sonnet. So I think that's an example where you're re really making explicit your textual source, but, you're, but it in a really creative way and not in a sense that feels derivative or that you're that the dance is assuming a, as Linda Hutchin mentions the idea of being secondary just because it's chronologically subsequent so yes I think there's no right answer to, to the way that text is used but I just personally love when dance asserts itself as being just as good <laughs> so much Megan I think you you said it there <laughs> so it it just remains for us to thank Megan for a really stimulating talk and I, I can see the way themes are joining up now in the in the conference over the two days so it'll be so interesting to put it all together tomorrow anyway thank you very much indeed other uh, there's nothing in the chat is that no okay thank you Megan. thank you